again, it, it, it's really a difficult one. I've never, I've never pieced together from the very beginning as to you know the whole trajectory, the whole way up, and I'm definitely. It'll probably definitely give people an understanding as to what way my brain is wired. Relax and take notes while I take totes of the marijuana smoke. Throw you in a choke, gun smoke, gun smoke. Biggie smoke for mayor, the rock slayer, the hook a layer. Motherfucker, say your prayers. Welcome to the Earnest Podcast with myself and Alan. This has been in the works for quite some time. Um, shout out to Don for getting everything set up and ready to go last minute. So, long waiting. Alan? Yeah, welcome guys. Obviously this is something that we've had in the pipeline for, I don't know, we've been speaking about it for maybe two or three years. Yeah. It was something that there was, there was definitely a lot of interest in, but just the way my schedule is and, and so on and so forth, I just couldn't commit the time to it. Um, but now, still can't commit the time to it, but <laughs> I have committed, you know, once a month, the goal is to get an informative podcast across but something that is you know as i said informative but you know enjoyable so uh, i want it to be entertaining but at the same time you know it is important to both of us that you know we do educate on all things you know from, from the training vector bodybuilding physique development coaching you know and everything in between pd so on and so forth so it's of great importance to me. I know it's obviously of great importance to you. and something that, as I said, we spoke about so many times. So here we are, 4 a.m. You just can thank me for being here. You know, yeah. It's no compromise. Um, so yeah, my man. So today is is a little bit different. And, and like, as we said there, after this, it, it's more so round tables, picking a topic, oh, so sure. on and so forth. Today is, who is AKA? Yeah. Yeah, so big question. It's a difficult one to a difficult one to you know, really sort of articulate and put into put into a podcast, especially with the way my brain works. And you know, it's it's, it's more free balling today than any, than anything else. Um, so, what do you want to know? Is the question. So, I think everyone kind of wants to know kind of the beginnings and how we yourself came to this point so starting off with just back early childhood from start to current I think getting to know you and how you tick and how this has all come about I think is something that is going to be the main focus of this conversation and then from there we can kind of delve into obviously potential questions or deviate from from that but I think that's the the meat and potatoes for today. Okay, so early, going back early, early. Like early, yeah. As early as possible, straight out the womb early. <laughs> so, I was born to my mother. <laughs> um, so, again, it, it, it's really a difficult one. I've never, I've never pieced together from the very beginning as to, you know, the whole trajectory, the whole way up. And I'm definitely... It'll probably definitely give people an understanding as to what way my brain is wired um, and, and why why it's wired like this. But So basically, like most, I come from a, a real working class family. Um, I grew up in Talent in Dublin. Obviously, you're living in Nice now, so I grew up in Talent in Dublin. Um, I had a difficult, difficult... I guess you could say childhood in the sense that so there was a tragedy in my family you know, early on um, when my sister passed that obviously as you can imagine had a huge effect then on my parents um, my mom and my dad who before I start this like you know I don't want anything that I that I say here to be taken out of context that you know I was loved dearly by my man dad and, and so on and so forth. So, but I do feel that for me to be to be honest and, and, and really sort of show why my character is the way my character is, um, it's definitely to give an insight from the very beginning. So, as a child, obviously that that tragedy, which I'm not going to touch too much on, um, happened within my family. It definitely had a, an adverse effect on my mother and my father um, and my sister Louise as well. So. Um, 
my mom worked you know a lot you're, you're 40 hours a week you're, you're Monday to Friday um, type of job my dad was you know very busy working Monday to Friday he was also big into trying I think that that's actually what planted the seed with me um, big into you know powerlifting and, and sort of just that old school generation of of physique development and bodybuilding etc so he he as a side job as I said we didn't have much money at all when, when, I, when I was growing up so his a side job was security guard and bodyguard and you know, personal protection so on and so forth so he wasn't there a lot so I had a minor so as many kids do but unfortunately um for a few years then I got physically abused by the minor um so basically it's, it's difficult to even talk about it but she just kicked the shit out of me like constantly so um one of the one of the big standout things and this is not a poor me thing to say as I said you know, a common question that we can be asked if we could change anything about anything would we would you do so and, and the answer for me is I'd never want to you know have that butterfly effect and affect who I am today because I'm here because of circumstances and I'm not a product of a poor environment I'm a product of a character I've built so for me I was abused for a while um and she used to hit me with the poker out of fire um and that you know obviously as a kid, and I've, I've always heard about people that were, you know, abused, be it emotionally, physically, sexually, and they never did anything about it. And I could always relate because you always sort of, I, you never, it almost felt normal, if, if, that, if that's a strange thing to say. Like, it's weird to think that, you know, getting bed up was normal. But basically, to give a synopsis before I move on, it was like, one of, one of the memories that we all have vivid memories that stick in my head and one of the vivid memories is that I was sitting in the kitchen and she told me to tie my shoelaces I think I was like four or five years of age couldn't tie my shoelaces so she started hitting me with the poker of the fire so not very pleasant obviously um, so there was a lot of you know confusion maybe getting your, your own internal you know belief in yourself shattered at such a young age was not good and does lead down to f further aspects that happen later in my life which I'll touch on so that happened and one of the things you know and, and it'll tie more into you know as I went on is that I carried a lot of anger anger because circumstances at home you know my parents didn't know what was actually happening to me um, and anger at her as an individual but to, should be told now um i forgive her like it's she, she wasn't mentally well she actually committed suicide years later um from what i've been told um i'm not going to name her name or anything like that but she committed suicide years later and look you know she had her own demons and and unfortunately you know it is what it is yeah so that sort of at the age of like four five six i can't really i can't really obviously it's so long ago i can't really tell when it when it finished um but you know things at home weren't weren't great and and for me then sort of growing up in, in that then was you know it is what it is so moving through and moving on then you know there's there's still there were still like aspects at, at home we got a new minder i think it came out after a while as to what was happening i think my dad copped on um, and my dad would be, you know, hugely protective individual. And I think that that's where I probably get that from. Um, and, you know, that, that was gone. That was parked aside and we, we moved on. And just a normal childhood. I had great friends in Tala. Sort of that, you know, working class, estate, play, out playing football, sports mad, out from like 7 a.m. until 9 p.m. Just a normal, normal kid life. So, um throughout the end so where are we i ended up i got ran over got knocked over by a car and i think that looking back i think that that i think it was six i fractured my skull i ended up as was quite bad i ended up in the hospital for quite a bit and i think at that point i never spoke to her about it but i think at that point because of the circumstances about how i got ran over was probably a wake-up call for you know Ma, maybe that you know he needs a little bit more attention or whatnot. And again, look, love my ma to death. Um, 
but you know, she had to deal with her own things as well. Um, so skimming through there, then, as I said, and as you can imagine, there was there was other things, you know, with, with how my dad had to deal with things. The family was sort of divided and broken. Um, you know, there there was other aspects where I'm probably not. There's probably no need for me to go into, but you know, with, with my dad was so on and so forth so I, I don't like I don't really feel like there's there's too much really that would directly influence me but I spent a lot of my childhood being confused no belief in myself um, and always just start having that underlying level of worry and I think that 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 was planted in me from herself the minor at an early age so as we went through then I think I was 12 my parents moved to Blessington in Wicklow. So I came, you have to imagine, I came from Tala to Blessington. And I, and I thought Blessington was just like countryside. I thought it was like, Jesus Christ, where are you moving me to? So we moved there. A big culture change for me, um, a shock for me. But there was a lot of other guys there that had moved up from Dublin and, and moved there who I sort of gelled with then. You know, going into school, I was actually going into first year. So you can imagine, if you don't know anybody, you've never been to primary school with anybody. And I don't have much belief in myself. Mm-hmm. And unknowns to myself, I have, I, have a, I have a real high level of anger inside me from generating from my childhood. Um, and this belief in, in what my capabilities would be. So I went into, into first year very, very self-conscious, you know, and scared is probably the best way to do it. I think, you know, a person I can only take from my own my own, you know, circumstances. I don't know if you were ever scared going into when you when you made the transition from primary school into secondary school, but you probably knew everybody, so it's probably a little bit different. But I didn't know anybody. And you're coming from from obviously a different environment, it's a little bit daunting. So I went into school. One of the things that and this comes to this comes from not having any belief and having you know a certain identity about yourself is that I always I found fit out really quickly that I had to act a certain way to be accepted. So being the new kid, kid on the you know coming in was there was a level of almost like people would try pick on you, try bully you, and I'm not the character as you know to 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 get bullied. So. I amplify it. So if someone tried to bully me, I amplify that like tenfold. Um, so you, you couldn't bully me. Um, so going through school then, I found out really quickly that, okay, I had to be somebody. That wasn't actually me, but I did have a high level of anger. And I, I went through sort of secondary school. I was intelligent, but I purposely didn't try because I didn't want to, I wanted to fit in. Yeah, I didn't want to be I didn't want to be the the smart kid because I felt that the smart kid or the kid that studied or the kid that did this or that wasn't going to be liked. Mm-hmm. So I had no you, when you've no belief in yourself and you don't know who you really are. And obviously look a lot of kids at that age teenagers don't they don't know who they are. They haven't found the pattern and by right you're not supposed to know your path really at that age. So but because I had no no real belief. My my sort of outlet was, well, I'm going to be the cool kid. You're, you're not going to fucking bully me, mm. you know. Um, and that backfired. And, and looking back at how I how I conducted myself in secondary school, it is a big regret for me. Where where my outlet was, who I could actually be myself, was through sports. And I was a sport crazy. I played high level soccer. Um, I was in representative squads. I I boxed. I GAA and, and I found that I could express myself through sport and, and could just be me and accept it for that. So that was definitely the route that, you know, I, I really put my attention in. But I always found then that when I went back into school I had to sort of pretend to be someone else. Until then, you know, I, I went through school and behaviour was the way my behaviour was. Forced is probably the best way to, to, to state it. After school then, um I wanted to be a I wanted to always move into this industry. There was no ifs or buts about it. I knew, you know, I, I was always really interested in maximizing performance. You know, why some days when I was playing soccer would I have l- less energy? Why some days would I be like flying? 
so what what's happening internally there and then you know, as we all do like when we're growing up like we've got action figures mm-hmm. you're, you're watching action movies and you're seeing these physiques and obviously I've I'd always seen bodybuilding and I'd seen my dad and you know how into training he was and you know my godfather and so on and so forth and that was always sort of ingrained in me so I was like this is this is what I want to do but unfortunately this is 2008 the country was in a recession so it was difficult to to really sort of and, and bear in mind, I don't have any belief in myself because I, I pretended to be a character in skill and now I'm out of skill. And I, I, I'm like, who the fuck am I? Mm-hmm. You know, what can I offer to, to anybody or anything? I have this, I've got this reputation of having this wild temper, um, which we'll touch on in a second, but it was all amplified. And people say to me now, like, oh, geez, Alan, you seem really calm, you know, I'm only calm because of all the other shit that brought me here to be calm. You know, I'm not somebody now that has a temper. Like, if something happened now, it doesn't affect me. I don't really let anything affect me anymore. But anyway, I come back into into the point where it's the country's in a recession. I unconfidently mentioned to my dad, this is the route that I want to go. And, and look, my, my dad only cares for my well-being, my career, my path and, and personal development. And he can only judge me from you know, what he's seen. And he's like, that's a silly career to go down. There's no such thing as personal training. Oh, there's no such thing as online coaching at the time. You know, gyms are very much leisure centers in Ireland. And personal training is a commodity. It's not, it's not something that people have. It's like if, if the rich are there and like really wealthy and they like they can do it but it's not a necessity whereas now it, it's I, I deem it as essential to have a coach when if you're embarking on a journey in fitness and personal development you need to have a coach it's it's fast tracking you know what you're doing we are your first line of defense when it comes to healthcare, and we've spoke about that before and so that conversation got shut down and because i have no in, internal belief it it there's no questions then for me. It's like, oh, yeah, no, you're right. I wouldn't be able to do this. Um, and it was sort of said to me, look, you don't have the temperament to deal with people. You don't, you know, you'll never make any money from that. And these were sort of the comments that I was hearing. It's not a career. It's not this. It's not that. And for a while then I believed that. So I was like, right, well, what else am I interested in? I've always had a decent business brain, unknowns to myself. So I was always into know cars important cars selling cars so on and so forth so i was like i'm gonna be a mechanic watched fast and the furious i was like i'm gonna be don terrell <laughs> so, <laughs> so i was like i'll be a mechanic i ended up getting a job in sandyford anyone from ireland will know where that is it's south dublin um in a mazda and opal garage as a first year apprentice wasn't what you know i, I was thinking i was gonna be working on race cars Clean, wor- cleaning stuff up yeah not changing wheels on a Clio <laughs> so it wasn't fantastic and when I was in there I've never felt I, 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 and this is genuine I've never felt a level of frustration and anxiety ever in my whole life even as a kid when everything was happening to me and the circumstances that happened I never felt that like I did there and I was treated like an idiot I came in on a first year apprentice. They never signed me up to FOSS. They had me valet in cars. They just looked at me like I was worthless. That then brought back then, you know, that, that, that question, well, maybe you are. Maybe you have got nothing to offer. Remember, like, you were abused as a kid. You know, your only outlet was football. I'd actually stopped playing football at this time. You know, I acted a character during school, and now I'm lost. And, and there's so many people that will come out of school. I did an all right, I got an all right leaving cert because I was, you know, I was intelligent enough to get decent leaving cert without studying, which I don't recommend. But um, I, w- I was playing a character. So now I'm like, I have no identity. So this brought all of that up again into fruition until I said to myself, I, I sat down and I was like, fuck this. You know, it's, I can either, you know, believe in myself and take that you know have that blind faith that I am going to be somebody and I have got things to offer and I am going to use you know that that level of singular focus that I have internally that I knew I had deep down because I'd seen I was able to put that into football 
I was able to put that into any sporting endeavor. So I'm going to use that and utilize that. Now I'm going to put, because I was, as this was going on, like, I was your normal, like, 18 year old. Like, even though I was in the garage working on cars, I'd still be checking my tricep in, 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 the, in, in the mirror. So I, I was training. Yeah. Um, when was the earliest point when you started training? When was it starting to be serious for you? My earliest point of being in a gym was probably at the age of like five or six. So I used to sit on the rowing machine, um, like a concept rower, at the at the front of a gym, and I and I'd watch and I'd observe. I, I'd see my dad, my godfather, who was my godfather was actually an except exceptional shape. He went over to the gladiators. Remember gladiators yeah, in the yeah, UK? Yeah. So I was always observing and watching. Um, so it was always sort of planted in my seed that I wanted to look like that. I wanted to be big, I wanted to be strong, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I started training then lifting, maybe at like 15 or 16, not having a clue what, what I was doing, you know, bicep curls, bench press, <coughs> more bicep curls. Yeah. Um, so around that age, and then as I went into... As I was 18 now, and I'm in, I'm in that garage, and it's when I started to take things a little bit more serious. So I joined a gym in Blessington, and I joined a gym in City West. Um, and I started training, got more and more into it, and then I had that conversation with myself. I think I was six months into doing my apprenticeship, getting paid €180 Euro, um, a week. Um, broke. So I was like, right, what am I going to do? Do I have to do something? I basically just... Went into work one day. Didn't tell my parents because I knew I had a conversation with Doug. Went into work one day um, and politely told them that I wasn't going to work there anymore. Politely. politely, very politely. And I got my tools, popped them into my car. Um, what was the car at the time? A Nissan Pulsar VZR, an import. <laughs> it's a baby. So I got my tools, put them into the um, car, drove off. Um, I ended up selling that car. As I said, I was always sort of in the Unknown to myself, a bit of a wheel dealer in that sense. Still are. So, yeah, I don't <laughs> plan to, I'm, I'm a car tramp. Um, so, saw that um, and I got a job. So, I was like, right. I went to my dad. I said, this is what I'm doing. This is not asking for advice. I'm just telling you now, out of politeness, this is what I'm doing. This is the career path that I'm going on. I'm 18 years of age. You know, the typical, I'll do what I want. Yeah, yeah. And, but at this stage, I was really ready for that. I was like, I'm, I'm believing in me. You know, this is, I know I can make this work. When was the switch? When did you, when did you, when did you know, right, I'm going to have to... June 2008. So I'll never forget it. So June 2008, July, sorry, July 2008. I was 18 and... A few months. Yeah, and I was, uh, I was ready then just to, to just to, to, to do me then. So I went and worked for a summer in a German um, garage because... As I said, when, when that conversation with my dad didn't really go great. Too well. Yeah, yeah not too well. No. Like, so, because he didn't see a career path in it, and I absolutely get it. Like, the country's, in, yeah, the country's in recession. Um, so it's at this period of like 2008, 2009, 2010, it's not a good time for the country. So I get his worries, etc. cetera. And, and maybe because I was acting a certain way through my adolescence that he, he wholeheartedly believed that I wouldn't be capable of it. So... Um, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I kept that seed then in my head that I was like, you know, prove everyone wrong. I'm going to prove me wrong. I'm going to prove that girl that abused me wrong, that woman that abused me wrong. I'm going to prove everybody wrong, and I'm going to push. So at that point, I made a pact to myself that I am going to be the best at this. So, you know, from a from a coaching perspective, from all aspects around, you know, this industry. I'm not only going to be better than, you know, what I thought I can be, what other people thought I can be. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be the best in the country. I'm going to be the best in the world. That was my mindset. So I worked in a German um, production uh, factory. And I was working, I think the shift I was working was 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. It was a disaster. But it was money. So I utilized that, I saved and I utilized that money then to do my first personal training course. Some bullshit course. Mm. Bear in mind, I could have I could have just went straight into sports science and strength and conditioning from my from my leaving cert. 
that I was lost. Yeah. So I said, right, well, this is the this is the route that I'll go. And I had no I had no no guidance. I had no like f- what I've been to you, I had none for me. Do you know what I mean? So I had nobody to say, Al, you know, this is what you need to do, or do a PLC, go this route, this route. I was just sort of finding things out, but I just had it in here that I'm gonna be the best at this. No matter what it is, I'm gonna be best at it. I'm gonna outwork everyone. So I went, finished up in, I think I worked like four months, saved a couple of thousand euro, saw my car, um, and then I did some bullshit, um, some bullshit course. Um, met some great people there, one of which is, it turned out, he turned out to be a fantastic coach. You know, big up Alan Stewart if, he, if he's listening to this. He's a good friend of mine. I don't speak to him enough. And anyway, he really good coach. I met him there. Really clicked, and you know, it's people that you, that you that you click with, and we were both sort of at the same sort of point in our life, um, where you know we really wanted this to work, and he's very successful in his own right and in, in, in the niche that he has in, in this industry. So, I left the course knowing that it was a bullshit course, sort of with the mindset of, okay, well, this will allow me get in, get insurance and get my foot into the gym. So, but I'd never tried to to to, to really get a job in a gym. I'd just been members of gyms and training, and I was in decent shape. So I went down to the gym, you know, as you do, there's my CV, expecting that they just hire me straight away. Yeah. So basically laughed at. True, I, I think I've tried, geez, I must have tried about 20 different gyms over the space of six months. Um, couldn't get anything, but was still flat out training. And as time perspired then, I was getting in better and better shape. And the more I was getting in shape, you know, the more I was obsessed with this. So, um, at this point, it's all I could think about. Physique development. I want to know everything. I was just a man on a mission. What age? This is like age like 19 to 21. And I was just, you know, obsessed. So then I ended up getting a job, if you could call it a job. Basically, I walked back into a gym in Nice that I had. Uh, this is how I ended up in Nice. I ended up walking back into a gym in Nice. And it was basically, I was looked at, oh, you again. So I went in and I spoke to the manager um, at the time. And I, in fairness to him, although he shafted me a little bit, <laughs> in <laughs> fairness to him, he listened to me, he heard me out. And for whatever reason, he let me stay there, but I didn't get paid. So it was a case of, I went in, I was like, just give me a chance. I'm, I'm applying to all these gyms. You can see that, you know, I love this. No, I have my certification. I'll do, you know, I had all my spinning certs, my kettlebell certs, and so I think I did. I think I did an Olympic weightlifting course, level one and level two, within that time with the spare money that I made from after finishing the first course, before, after working then in in that in that um, in that German factory. So I, I think I, I got one or two certs done as well on top of that. I thought it was great. So I was like, yeah, look, this is what I know, not knowing what I don't know which is the biggest aspect that I see people fall on now. So ignorance to what I don't know. And he said to me, he was like, look, come on in. We'll get you some experience. You'll work for work for two weeks. And at least you'll have that on your CV. I was like, perfect. In my head, I was going to be, like, I'm going to be the best one here. So I'm going to work harder than everybody. So I used to come in early and I'd stay there all day. I'd do every single class. Any, any, class, that, any class that they had on their roster, even if I didn't know how to do it, I would just jump in. I'd be like, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Any of the um, consultations, it was literally, I'd put myself everywhere. But that two weeks then turned, that first month turned into two months, the two months turned into three months. Frustration on my end is starting to build because remember, I'm I'm broke at this stage. Um, But thankfully, uh, and this is something that, you know, I, I live by is that your work dictates your worth my own self-worth start to build up because I seen that the the members of the gym really took to me. I was getting a lot of positive feedback. You know, my classes were full, always full. There was waiting lists, so on and so forth to do it. So I started to build that confidence that I had from a sporting endeavor now into a personal, uh, now into a professional endeavor. So this was a little bit of a game changer for me. So I marched back into the <laughs> into his office and. I was like, what's it going to be? If, if, if it's three months on now, if I don't get a contract, I'll leave, I'll go to a different gym. 
I'm very thankful of the members that were in that gym at the time. They all wrote letters of complaint because I was vocal. I was like, I'm not being paid. Um, and they all wrote letters of complaint in and I ended up getting my first contract, delighted with myself. So getting paid buttons, but it wasn't about that. It was now I was, that worked inside me and that, that sort of mindset that if, if, if I stay obsessed with this, it's going to be worth it starting to be it's slowly being confirmed in my own mindset and that's where you know you'll always hear me say and I've said it to you many times I've said it to a lot of the coaches that work with me is that time spent obsessed so this was this was it for me this was that light bulb moment it's worth it so I ended up then going from part-time to full-time um I start then Every every penny that I earned, and this is probably where we delve more into the further education. Every penny that I earned, I put straight back into furthering my own edu- education. At this time, I had nothing formal, so I did Poliquin Biosig. Um, I did Poliquin. It was it was called at the time Poliquin Level One and Poliquin Level Two. It got changed at a later date to PCIP. I think it was called. That annoyed me that I didn't have the later cert, so I did that as well. You know, it's the same course. <laughs> um, so I did the three Polican courses and um, learned a lot off from Charles. Really, really invaluable to how to conduct yourself as a professional. And, and at the time, you know, this is 2012, maybe 2011. There wasn't a lot of people that was doing it um, in Ireland. So um, it was big in the UK. It was big, obviously, in Canada and America and so on and so forth. So I felt like... You know, I'm, I'm already leveling myself up based off of my internal belief to be better. So I went then, I think, a year a year or two of pumping everything back into, into my own education. I started building up my client base. I actually then managed the, the gym. So I went from working for free to being a part-time gym instructor to be a gym instructor to be the manager in the space of like 16 months, maybe, give or take. So I was really pleased with myself then. Um, knew I did want to manage a gym, but again, it was just a feather in my cap. Start building up my my personal training portfolio. Start doing a lot of hours in the gym floor. Again, at the same time then, always in the back of my head that I wanted to, to be doing more courses and more courses. So I went then and I formally did strength and conditioning then. And that was sort of my, first, my first insight into formal academia within this within this industry. After that, you know, throughout that journey, I found out that I didn't want to work with teams. I wasn't sure beforehand. You know, I just wanted to work with everyone and anyone that I could make be better. Um, but after that, I found out I didn't want to work with teams. So uh, my personal training was, was really busy then at, at this time. So I went back into that set manager. I said, look, this is how it's going to be. I don't want to manage the gym anymore. I need to step back into part-time hours um, and I'll pay rent. Obviously, they seen how busy I was, so my rent was through the roof. My rent is a lot more than I charge you. <laughs> <laughs> so my rent was through the roof um, at that time, and, and I was I was I was just getting busier and busier and busier. So I used to do like two classes. I think it was like a Monday and a Tuesday. I used to do like a six o'clock and a seven o'clock class, like a spin class and like a barbell pump class. Um, Monday and Tuesdays, and they were still hopping. They were really busy. And I was leveraging that then against my, my monthly um, rent that, at the time. So anyway, that, that sort of went on for a while to the point where I'm doing like 45, 50 PT sessions a week. Um, and this is back in like 2012, 2013. Like just very, very busy. I'm also at the same time getting, because obviously just by default for training, etc. you know, Moving into the bodybuilding world was something I was always interested in. It started to become more and more apparent. And it was doing them Pollockin Pollockin courses the the year prior was probably sort of that insight into this would be really useful to use with X, Y, and Z. So that was all starting to to, to come to fruition. I start competing, start doing photo shoots. What year was like competing when that kind of started? 2006. 12, 2013, in around that year, yeah. So your first show was like 2012? Uh, yeah, I think it could have been 2013. 
it was somewhere there, tw- 12 or 13. I wouldn't want to be a liar and, and say that. I'm sure it was somewhere in that somewhere time. Around, yeah. yeah. Do you remember the show where you placed? Nifma. Nifma. Yeah, yeah, Nifma. Really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you place? I think I got third. And the reason I got third was because I put coconut oil on. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I, I didn't know anything. Yeah. Um I had a, a a guy in the gym that at the time that I was working in an ace that was sort of telling me that you should compete and you should do this and you should do that. And in fairness, he never told me to put coconut oil on. In fact he was fuming at me. <laughs> he was a good he's a good guy. Um and you know obviously natural as well at the time, so no PDs, no nothing like that. Just dieted down, got into shape, did the show. And a clue what I was saying. Yeah, I even think I was wearing boxers. I don't even think I was wearing this bodybuilding like, the, the class. Yeah, um, it was like a fitness model. Oh right, yeah, yeah, sort yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. before because men's physique wasn't a thing then. Yeah, yeah. Classic physique yeah. certainly wasn't yeah. a thing. So I went and did that. Um, was told by the judge, look, you've got a really good physique, blah blah blah. But you ruined it with putting oil on, and uh, Stuck out. yeah, it's like a shiny <laughs> penny on stage. So anyway, I learned from that. Came back, um, got rebounded horrifically didn't know what was going on I, I ate like I'm nearly sure I ate like eight or nine Big Macs um, and vomited in McDonald's I think I was telling you about that I think you briefed yeah yeah mentioned in Belfast and hadn't just didn't have a clue about physiology or nutrition and, and like everything that I was doing was very like obviously as I said with strength conditioning and, and polypin it was very much team based you know how to make an athlete stronger faster cover so on so forth but never anything around hunger regulating hormones or the the science behind actually nutrition so my interest in nutrition spiked then because I, I couldn't keep control of my appetite I was like what is going on here and I went from being shredded to I think I put on close to 20 kilos most probably 19.9 was fat mm. I was like whoa what has happened here so that spiked my interest to the point of obsession so now I was like I, I don't want to do strength and conditioning. I'm finished that anyway now at this stage and just so happened to tie in at that time. So I went all in on nutrition. So then I went down the, the formal academia route of nutrition, which is great, obviously. Um, throughout that, I met Laurent, who obviously I put you on to after many years later to do the IOPN. It was a fantastic course, so shout out to Laurent. Guru performance back. It was guru performance back. So it was postgraduate, a postgraduate diploma. So you needed to have your degree to do it. And it was a two-year thing. But really, really in-depth. Really, really good. Learned so much about nutrition uh, tr- through him and, 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 and through that course. Then I went on. I did CISSN. And, and, and just went down the whole formal academia route in terms of nutrition and physiology. That was all well and good. But the biggest aspect that happened to me was Laurent rang me months later and he said, look, Alan, you know, I, I'm looking at doing an internship. I've um, headhunted you from, from, from obviously the, the academic course that you've done, blah, blah, blah. Would you come over to me? Um, so I went over, I traveled over to Norwich, stayed, stayed with Laurent, stayed in the, the Guru Performance Facility um, and it was life changing. So to see somebody that had such like I knew at this time, as I said, like I was, I was articulate. So uh, like I started to really believe, like I, right, I, I, I'm good at this. Like if if I actually stop being this character that I played, you know, I'm intelligent. I I know like I can really get a grasp of this. So to see an individual have that level of belief in me was was really really important to me. And it's probably unknown to him the effect that I had because it wasn't so much what he taught me over there what he taught me over there was basically everything that i that i knew from obviously years of studying it was showing me how to put it into practice but it was also showing me what what i'm capable of you know it was showing me what can happen when you when well, we all have boundaries we all have limitations and now you will understand as to why i had such profound limitations on myself and he basically just blew the walls down so i seen things like he always referred to me as, you know, it, it, what you know now is consultant level. What I do, you can do. You're capable of this. Who I work with, what I charge, you know, everything I have, you can have. 
and he showed me this and he really took me under his wing and I'll forever, ever be grateful for Laurent Bonnet. Um, huge, hugely, hugely important point in, in my life that time. After that then, I came back. It's actually even almost upsetting how much he, he changed things for me there. I came back with this new profound internal belief. And at the time I was, I went from, and this is the question that everyone asks. I went from Alan Kelly PT mm -hmm. to AKPT. And when I went over to Laurent, he basically said, what the fuck is AKPT? What the fuck is Alan Kelly PT? Everything you're doing now, you're either at a consultant level, you're too academic, academically qualified to just be called that, or you're a fucking brand. You know, and within the brand, you've got consultants. That's where AKA was born. So I came back, I was like, this is the route that I want to go. So I started AKA. Um, truth be told, everyone asked me, you know, what does AKA stand for? At the start, you know, it was obviously, and I know Don is, Ayers is perked up now, so he, he, he wants to know what I stand for as well. So at the start, it was Alan Kelly PT. Then I went to AKPT. And then I was like, right, well, what can I create a brand around, a vision around? And it went, then I, I thought of AKA because of obviously, you know, it, it runs off the tongue. It's mm -hmm. something that, that's easy. And I can obviously build that going forward with a house of coaches. So I think it started as Alan Kelly's Athletes, I think. If... I'm almost certain that, that that's what it was. But AKA is nothing. I don't want it to be Alan Kelly because I think, you know, AKA is is no longer just about me. AKA is it's about Irish de physique development, physique coaching and the standard. That that's that's how I want it to be. So I don't ever want it to be that it's Alan Kelly such and such and these are Alan Kelly's coaches. It's not it it's the brand and it's it's to to bring up everything yeah? yeah so i've never really broken down to you know well what does it mean it's aka and, and that's what it is it's not what it means it's what it stands for and the, and and the principles behind it and the level of coaching that you get there that's that's aka so i started building that and i came back to him i was like i came back from laurent i was like there's no more doing one or two classes here. I went in, I was like, I'm done. I'll just pay whatever rent because I could afford it at the time because I was obviously really, really busy on the floor. At this stage, I'm like five or six years. No, I'm about five years into doing 50, 60 PT sessions a week. So I've always had that mindset of like working, 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 working. And still at the same time, putting more money into, into my education. So I got to that point then where I came back of no longer doing PT. I pay rent. That got taken advantage of. My rent went extortionately high. Then I seen Extreme CSC, which is like a bodybuilding gym, opened up in Nice. Pop down. I was prepping at the time. I think you remember. Oh, I remember. Yeah, so I think I can forget. Yeah, so I popped down to do a session. I think I was about two weeks out. And I had other athletes competing in that show as well. So I was quite stressed. And I was actually just finishing up. I think I was finishing up my formal academia, so it was sort of all tied in there. Uh, we're coming back from Laurent. And, it's your master's. Yeah, and I was I literally just got back, and I came down to you, and then I seen you, mm -hmm. and I was chatting to you briefly. I think I was explaining to you that I was on peak week, mm -hmm. and then I left for a while. I competed. Joe didn't go the way I wanted it to go, and then I, I came back then. I was like, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just coach from here, and I'm going to build my hub from here. It's 2018 as well. So this is... It's 2017. Oh, 2017, yeah, sorry. Yeah, this is 2017. Yeah. So obviously I'm five years into being extremely busy with coaching. So I brought my client base over and CSC basically turned into AKA. Yeah. 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 So um, I started coaching you then. Now we had chatted years before. You just showed me an email from 2015. Yeah, um, so I was I was 17 at the time. I remember training in Monreed when I was 16. And that's kind of where training started to get a bit more serious off the back of rugby and then I kind of saw you and how you were operating in the gym and I was like obviously you had some kind of idea of what competing was and that looked cool and I was like right 
I'm going to approach Alan and see, can I do it? And like I'm 17, just turned 17. Hadn't even done your leaving search. I haven't done my leaving search. Um, don't have a job. Yeah. Like, oh no, I did have a part time job. Um, but not obviously making enough money to hire a coach and go down the competing route. But I was really interested in it. I still remember that con- consultation going into yeah. the room, breaking myself, um, having that conversation. And this was obviously 2015. And obviously, couldn't do it. Just didn't make sense in school. Mm-hmm. I think I said that to you. I think I was like, "Look, do your yeah, do your leave and start, then um, get a job and come back to me." Yeah. And then fast forward a couple of years, and Literally, you're working yeah. extreme. Yeah, working in extreme. I was I was as surprised to see you there yeah. as you were to see me there. Yeah, yeah. So when I went in there, then you know, I, I just fell in love with the place straight away. And as I said, we brought all my clients over, and it, the, it, was, it was such a good vibe, wasn't mm-hmm. it? It was yeah. really, really good. It was really bodybuilding orientated um at this point when i made that move i was actually working in iron house in dublin which wasn't wasn't the environment that that i wanted to be in um some really good bodybuilders there but just it wasn't my cup of tea at the time um so i put all my ducks in the in, in the csc basket you came on board i you were actually my first intern then, so I seen you. I seen obviously potential in you, and 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 the want to, the want to know everything, and that reminded me of me. So at that age, then I was like, right, well, I'm gonna take you on. You're gonna, I'm gonna mold you into, you know, not make the same mistakes I did, and fast track everything for you. So that's you start coaching with me then, and then learning about physique development. Um, and start building then from there we directed you down obviously the educational path um you were in college at the time yeah I so i actually that. dropped out i dropped out yeah. of college to, to pursue that so i was your mom can thank me for that yeah, yeah. <laughs> my mom was like well, just finish it out i'm like yeah. no i'm gonna i'm gonna cut this so i was literally finishing up going on because the whole idea i wasn't obviously very good in school i wasn't very um academia wasn't really it wasn't really my call and it was more so playing rugby and wanted to obviously excel playing rugby and then didn't really do well in my leaving search went to do obviously a plc to kind of as a stepping stone to go into university and i wanted to study it was like at the time was health and performance science in, in ucd and that was kind of my goal and then i thought it was bullshit yeah <laughs> well yeah i i want i wanted to do i wanted to go down instead of the the, the team route and going and and focusing on working with teams, I wanted to go down the, the personal training route, the coaching work route, working with individuals, mm-hmm. and then dropped out literally a few months before finishing, obviously at PLC. You said, "Look, do this um, personal training certificate." It was uh, NSCA CPT. Did that, um, and then obviously at that point, literally as I completed it, CSC closed down. So at that point, it was like, right, what do we do now? And I think that's kind of what kind of leads on yeah. to the next chapter. So when, when, when we sort of go back to that with CSC, you have to remember I brought everybody over mm. to the gym and then halfway through a PT session um, with a client who's still with me, the owners come in, lock the doors, turn off the music, and it's like, it's done. Like, And I'm left sitting there. I have some money obviously saved away. I was like, right, it's sink or swim now, you know. I I don't have you know, I don't come from a wealthy family, so I don't have that sort of, you know, backbone of security there. I have I had thirty thousand euro. That that's what I had saved up. That's my life savings. And it's at that point then where it's like it's sink or swim now, Al. So, you know, it's it's that push, that nudge to get uncomfortable. And keep getting uncomfortable. And the common trend with my whole life is that I've always tried to to be as uncomfortable as possible. And it's funny because at that point in my life, I was actually thinking about going full time lecturing. Mm. So I was I was at a crossroads whether I was actually going to move over to the UK and spend more time with Laurent and go down that educational route because I loved ed- educating people, but you know, I loved coaching people more. So. This was the nudge that I needed then to be like, no, look, now it's time to really build. So I opened up the muscle clinic. And at the time, I was doing 50-50 one-to-one. 
and and online coaching. This is 2017, gone in 2018. Uh, 2018. Yeah, so I opened up the muscle clinic then in 2018 and half my client base were online, half my client base was one-to-one. And then I got to really work closely with you Every Friday morning, you'd be in with me. Yeah. We prepped you for your yeah, first show. It was Friday morning, yeah. Yeah, I was just down the road as well, like literally from here. It's just down the road. Literally the other side of the town, yeah. So I was really able to, you know, build you in terms of, you know, this this is really go in depth with, with exercise mechanics, so on and so forth. Actually, exercise mechanics is something then that I got really heavily invested in, where I did RTS twice. I did, well, M1 came later, but at that stage I was very much, you know, RTS, 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 oh, RTS. Yeah. Um, so I was teaching you all of this and it allowed you get a really good grasp of, you know, what that was and what that is and the do's and the don'ts as it pertains to exercise mechanics. So it was a really invaluable period of time that built our rapport, but it also built you as, you know, a coach and, and getting, getting your feet wet and competing as well as a natural. So... That went well. Obviously, I think well, I was open there a year. And in my mind, I was like, I'm too comfortable. So I'm like, I bought myself out of the contract. So you've, I got a five-year lease. I had to pay four years to get out of the lease, which is not a nice thing to have to do. And then I took the leap to go down to the H, but is now the HQ. November. It was November. November 2019 19, yeah. is when I moved in. It was operating then really properly from about December. Mm -hmm. And at this time, you know, we're heavily involved in, I think, you know, I don't think there's much courses at this stage that I hadn't done aside from formal academia. I brought you over with me to do Muscle Nerds with Luke Lehman. Yeah. Done RTS twice. I've done all the Poliquin. I've, I've really just been obsessed for years upon years now. So we're coming up to a decade of obsession now over this. And the clientele is starting to build. You've gone from your normal lifestyle transformations to a few years prior to this to start prepping people for shows and then it's first time competitors and then you've got with that for first time competitors you've got obviously your photo shoot preps. A couple of years later then it, it's you know these first time competitors are seasoned competitors and they want to win and then you accumulate wins and then it's talks of, you know, well I want to compete abroad. And this at this point of time this is where it's at. It's two thousand nineteen. I just signed the lease. It's like, this is going to be the hope. We're going to do seminars. I'm going to have my athletes down here. And then COVID hit. And then COVID, yeah. Then a big curveball. Yeah. Now, bear in mind, I emptied my bank account to, to open the muscle clinic. And then I emptied my bank account again to open the HQ. Mm. Because I had to buy out of the clause as well, the lease. So... Coming into COVID then, I've got the facility where what we're, we're a month, we're two months in and, you know, COVID happened, etc. I don't have much money in the bank. I'm doing 50, I'm doing 50, 50 still between online and no, I'm actually doing about 70, 30. I'm mostly online. Um, and then it's, I'm doing about 30% of my clientele were one-to-one. -one. And then when that happened, then it's a case of, Everyone is online. Everyone wants fucking home workouts. Mm. Disaster. So again, we've got this facility with nothing. To, I don't know what to do with it. And it's like months are rolling by. It's like it's not opening. You know, people are dropping off. Now, w to be fair, it's a blessing in disguise because one, it allowed further education, which is obviously massively important. It allowed us build the gym um, to the way I actually wanted it and not just open it because I needed to open it and build a website and the exercise tutorials and so on and so forth. So look, COVID was a blessing in disguise and we actually did quite well in it. But at the start, it was scary. And, you know, where does a challenge, there's a choice, right? So it's either sink or swim again for me. So it's at that point then where we've seen it out and things really start to kick on then from there. Then once it opened back up then, you know, there's been other coaches that, 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 that have come in and um, that have been working from there. We've had obviously... A hell of a lot of you know from from the transformation and, and physique development perspective, a hell of a lot of success in terms of you know client results on stage uh, and just as as a unit, it's been you know, th there's there's very arrogant. I don't think there's anyone in the country that has really outdone us in terms of physique development over ten years. Um, 
and it's really just kicked off from there then and that sort of kept snowballing up and then and, and we're here and you know one of the big aspects for me is that I and I've spoke about this before is that you know we all suffer to some extent of imposter syndrome and there's sometimes where you, know, you get these inquiries coming through and you know people are referring to you as like the authoritative figure etc but you know, I bring it back to your your work is your worth, and that level of authority only comes from putting the reps in. So, you know, at this point now, I'm I'm 32 now. We, we've gone back from me starting when I was like 18, 19, 20. So I've been through every job. I've thousands of of people I've worked with, and thousands of hours spent on the gym floor. So it's and thousands and thousands of euros spent on informal and formal academia it's been worth it and, and that's what i would say to other coaches is that you're not a product of your environment you know you're a product of what you deem as a limitation and you need to have that self-belief in yourself to be able to move forward because there's got to be times throughout your journey especially in this journey especially now that you're gonna feel like i'm never going to be able to get to where aka is i'm never going to be able to do x y and z i'm not going to be able to work with these type of clients you can but you can't if you don't believe you can you have to have that blind faith in what you're doing um, and it's as simple as that and that's where the, the the whole thought process of earn it comes from because it's been something that i've said to myself and i, I use it with my athletes now but it's been something that i've said to myself since day one i'm going to earn the respect of me so it's I want to be the person that I respect so you know if I was coming up again would I look up to me and if I can answer wholeheartedly with yes then I'm on the right path so that's where I'm at now and, and obviously we, we have the HQ is thriving at the moment we have a lot of unbelievable members there like it, it's it's so heartwarming to walk in there and see Obviously, everyone trying in the atmosphere. It's a really, really special place. Obviously, you know, we've invested heavily into the equipment there, but equipment is not everything when it comes to, to a gym. It's it's the members, and that's so important to me, like, that it's a place where everyone can develop, um, coaches, members alike, and no one's judged. Everyone is there to lend a helping hand, and this is, this is hugely important for me, and that's been a huge fulfilling aspect of what I'm doing right now. Um. So now it's 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 2023. There's the goals that I have now are are huge. They're not like I'm nowhere near where I want this to be. But the biggest bottleneck for AKA and any company is the owner, the entrepreneur. If if he or she tries to do everything themselves, you're going to be the bottleneck to your own growth. So for me, I always try to. I I struggle with with people saying to me you know you're the best coach in ireland you're the most regarded coach in ireland i really really struggle with that because not because i don't have belief in myself but because i want to i don't want to be the smartest person in the room i don't want to i, I want to be the smallest fish because once you keep putting yourself into that mindset well then you're going to keep growing the day that you you think that you're above everyone else is the day that you stop educating yourself if you stop educating yourself then you stop teaching clients uh, and that's it because there's another me coming through there's another hundred mm. me's coming through mm. do you know what i mean so it's it's really important now that and we do have obviously news pending which i'm not going to mention here or the whole aspect of aka expanding that is, that is coming to fruition which again i might mention what well, i will mention in a different podcast but the goals now are huge and, and i don't mind saying it here my number one goal here is to be one of the most regarded prep coaches in the world not ireland not the uk in the world simple as that um and i will earn that and you know as i said that earn it and i have it on, tattooed on my hands as well as some a, a cow stamp of aka <laughs> cow stamp but it, branded branded myself it's a constant reminder of me that no matter what i want in life i'm gonna earn it as simple as that so that obviously brings us into the present coming straight from the womb so anything that you would like to add to that or 
know we've got a couple of questions that we can delve into. Anything to add on top of that? Um, that pretty much covers everything. There's obviously a big gap between obviously 2020 when the gym opened and then up until now in terms of obviously the growth and what's happened in terms of competing and the accolades that have come from that because it's really snowballed and it's gotten very big and it's picking up a lot of pace, a lot of positive momentum. And the evolution of the gym has come a long way, especially over the, the, the last few months in terms of um, expanding with equipment, expanding with space, expanding with members. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I think you summed up everything quite well. I don't think there's anything we've missed. I think I missed the point on which I was traveling to the UK a lot throughout my formal academia side of things. But again, just, there's not too much to... To, to really touch on there was that was aside from obviously the expense of it that was the tax and time and that that was sort of tied into back when the time when I first joined Extreme where I was prepping etc and that sort of all came to a head but other than that that's that's been the trajectory here and as I said I don't believe we're even scratching at the surface as to where the capabilities are and you know it's hugely important for me and I know it's important for you that Irish bodybuilding moves forward and I'm blessed in the fact that I that I coach a lot of coaches obviously most of the people that I work with now at this stage are, are competitors but I want to have that I want to be that person that helps pull Irish bodybuilding up because Irish bodybuilding does get a bad rap um, and some of it is 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 rightly so there was a, a very much an old school ethos behind a lot of aspects that was happening here but I don't feel you're in a position to give Irish bodybuilding a bad rap if one, you haven't achieved anything over here and two, you're not willing to help it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's really important that, you know, stay here and, and I help with this. And this is not a, a, a dig at anyone. It's, it's just, this This is just facts. It's, you know, for me, I have obviously the opportunities to move away, um, but I won't. There's a reason why the HQ is there. There's a reason why, you know, I'm so gun ho on, on, on bringing this forward and we will see if we, we look at this in a year's time and you will see that we've done just that so that is it as far as the life of aka here we are i think we're only getting started so we'll get into some questions alan trooper question box on instagram which he usually doesn't answer so we're going to answer them today um i'll let alan take it away with the questions and yeah, yeah. First things first, sorry about that. Okay, so questions box. Okay, right, we have a good few. So we'll just go quick fire through some of them. So best advice you'd give somebody starting an online business small scale? So this, like a lot of these questions can almost be, you know, podcasting themselves. So just to keep it, you know, within the scope of, of what we're doing now. So everyone's advice would probably differ for this. I know that for me, I really feel if you want to be, you know, if we're looking at it from a small scale perspective, you know, don't just look at it from, a, you know, down the financial avenue. You know, I'm a firm believer that, you know, to be successful in this, you need to be results orientated, but you need to, and client focused, but you need to know how to do that. And I think that a big aspect of, you know, being a practitioner online, the precursor to that is being a practitioner for years, one-to-one -one on the gym floor. Aside from the obvious, which is, you know, academia and know-how and so on and so forth, I think that level of experience on the gym floor is something that is invaluable. But I think the biggest, you know, or one of another detriment that, that can happen when we're thinking about it, you know, as, as a on-the-side sort of things thing is that you're... you're, you're not prioritizing it so if you're not prioritizing your clients i think if you're looking at doing it small scale make sure that you're just not thinking small scale make sure that your attentiveness etc to the client is is there um and you know I, I really feel from that no matter what scale it's at you're organically going to grow and i think you know results speak a thousand words and i think for me that that's really cool. i could say you know, you need to have you need to have X amount of years on the gym floor, but if you don't, you know, I feel personally you're very limited in what you can do online. But 
just don't think small scale think you know i'm, I'm gonna do this and i'm not just doing it as a side earner mm-hmm. if that makes sense yeah yeah would you agree definitely yeah obviously again i think the just getting leads seems to be just something that it's always people gonna be prioritize a lot yeah. over the fact of education mm-hmm. obviously yes. results etc it's coaching yeah not, not being a saleswoman yeah. or a salesman yeah 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 so yeah That's we're good true. with that um alan what is your main interests check-ins <laughs> end of uh, next question i have that twice actually okay um, would you ever think of moving to moving along the lines of business consulting on the side of your coaching business? Um, no, no. For me, you know, I'm a coach first and foremost. I never, I cringe at the idea of being a businessman. Um, so for me, it's definitely not something that I'd be passionate enough. And for me, just w- with business as well, I'm learning on the go. Like I don't, I'm don't claim to be some fantastic businessman. I think you know, from a business aspect, it's Obviously, we're here in, in, in my cafe, but it's more so learning, you know, learning from your mistakes and maybe not dealing, not, not deeming things as mistakes and identifying the weaknesses and then moving forward um, with that as lessons. The only business advice I'd ever give to anyone is what I said during, during this podcast is that I do feel that the entrepreneur or the, the owner of a company will always be the biggest bottleneck if he or she is trying to, to control and do everything. But no, definitely not. I have no interest in, in, in being a business coach. Do you have interest in being a business coach? Mm, definitely not, no. It's too much of a focus on coaching. Yeah. So is Trent and either PED on prep? This is, Some man is definitely standing <laughs> standing with his phone writing this question with a bottle of Trent. He's like, hmm, I want to use this. Um, so look, understanding Trent and, and, and what way it works is probably key. Is it needed? No, nothing is needed. I hate... I hate talking about anything in absolutes. For you know, it just can't be absolutes as it pertains to to physique development. So, like Tren, obviously, it, 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 it's a nor nineteen drug. So we know that it um, binds to the glucocorticoid receptor, stops cortisol from binding there. So there's definitely a positive role in which it can play within prep to stop catabolism. So basically, st- hold on to tissue that you have. It's also very neural toxic, so it, it, you know at high levels, and it's definitely a dangerous drug, from what I've seen with, with how some people use it, and that's people that aren't well versed on the literature, or have just you know he said she said sort of mindset, or he's done this and he's got twenty one in jams, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Doesn't work that way. Is it needed? No. Can it be beneficial? Yes. It's dosage dependent, depending, and trend isn't the problem. Humans are the problem. Understanding. Its role in pharmacokinetics is key. Um, and if you're asking this question, I would absolutely make sure that you've got a coach that is well-versed on pharmaco- pharmacology in general. Simple. It's not that difficult to, 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 to find um, who knows what and who doesn't. Mm. As far as I'm concerned. Mm. Anything to add? No, I don't think so. No, that pretty much sums it up. Okay. Um. Outside of getting bloods, how would one know they are insulin resistant, sensitive, and any signs? What would you say about that? So outside of bloods, obviously you can do obviously a simple blood glucose test, finger prick test, obviously tracking that. Resting first thing in the morning, obviously postprandial, you can look at it in that sense. Obviously yeah. you can look at it within the bloods in itself you mentioned obviously um, i think yeah w- w- with this the sort of starting the question with outside of getting bloods done i think that if you did have any sort of worries that you know you had a high level of insulin resistance it just makes sense to just get your bloods done and mm-hmm. check hemoglobin a1c yeah, yeah. but you're right absolutely you do a fasted blood glucose test um you know if your fasted blood glucose is through the roof um uh, upon fasting you know there's potentially an issue there which will further warrant the need for bloods but Realistically, I I much rather test don't guess approach, and yeah. I don't know why you wouldn't. I don't know why you wouldn't just yeah. get bloods done, especially yeah. obviously like natural or natural. Oh, you if get get, get yeah. your bloods done if like, you're assisted and yeah, you know, the you're asking this question, you need to get your bloods done regardless. Yeah. So it has to be a frequent thing that you need to do, um, whether you are competing, obviously or not. If you're using anabolics, you need to, that's a must when it comes to the use of anabolics. 
Did I see your stat in the podcast? <laughs> yeah. You did. <laughs> What's the first podcast going to be about? Me. Um, okay. Alan, what is the best leg exercise? Bigger quads needed. Thank you from France. So we don't work in absolutes, as we just said. So when we're looking at, you know, hypertrophy from a training vector, we're, we're always relaying it back to the stimulation of high threshold motor units. When we can look at, you know, being exercise specific, you know, we need to understand, well, well, where does the challenge bring us through? Where is its limitations? What do you have? And then what can we work from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, I would be looking at this from there is no one set exercise. We we can look at bias in a length and range, mid range, short and range, pairing them together, looking at where your capabilities are or incompetencies are um, within the movement. And then as we said, bring it back to bring it back to the fundamentals of stimulation of high threshold motor units. If we bring it back to real life, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Standardizing form and bringing it to your proximity, your proximity of failure. Mm -hmm. You agree? Yeah. Bring on, yeah. Okay, here's one for you, Jack. So, is barbell shoulder pressing bad for shoulder hypertrophy, Alan? I hate when people say Alan at the end. <laughs> so, what was you? What would you think on that? I know, obviously, barbell pressing in general probably does get a bad rap, but I, don't know, I think there's there's a you know, there's room for everything when we don't take that absolute approach. Yeah, you know, it's just sort of understanding why. So relating it back to the individual, like who is it good for? Again, that individual have it's his or her's own limitations. So obviously relating it back to the individual, can this individual perform this exercise? There's going to be other things to consider in terms of availability of equipment. Is there something else that might be a bit more appropriate for that individual? And then in terms of, right, that movement in itself is going to look different from person to person in terms of their setup and how they execute that movement. So not being fixated on right this is the way this should look for everyone mm -hmm. and trying to obviously adapt the exercise to obviously fit the individual allow the individual to obviously do the exercise to his or her limitations yeah and i think that the tone in which this question is wrote is that this this individual is probably told that it is bad for hypertrophy or damaging for the glenal humeral joint and I would imagine whoever had that bias to say that to them was more so talking on the realms that you know it doesn't converge that you're working through a linear pathway which can potentially for some individuals could cause a lot of share through the glandular humeral joint but again nothing is bad nothing is good it's all about the individual yeah mm -hmm. um right so where are we what is the idea behind Ernest? and um, we spoke about we that spoke on the podcast, podcast yeah, yeah. Best place to get pharma grade primo. The only place to get pharma grade primo is from Bayer, and that is Turkey. Anywhere else, it's not pharma grade, no matter what anyone tells you. Whoever tells you different is probably trying to sell it to you. <laughs> um, so, is Mastron the answer to not using an AI? Um, no, there's Mastron primo, they're non aromatizing DHD derivatives, as we know. So, again, they're going to help mitigate the aromatization of testosterone back to estrogen. So, again, balancing that ratio, getting blood done every six to eight weeks and taking a titration model approach rather than, you know, just bucketing in and hitting your ceiling dose within a couple of weeks um, is going to be the smartest way. There is obviously a point of diminishing returns where if you're taking, if you're 300 pounds and, you know, your goal is to go to the Olympia or turn pro and you're at that higher caliber, caliber level, and you're running a higher level of obviously testosterone with that, there's going to be a point in which an AI is going to have to be utilized. But again, it is individual to individual. But I like in a lot of cases, I try to, to steer clear of any sort of AIs due to their um, due to the issues in, in how they're metabolized and how they act um, on different aspects, which again is outside the scope of this. So we will leave it at that. What should one consider before using PEDs, Alan? That's a big question as well. Um, just obviously, first thing is obviously like the, ram the ramifications from using it. Yeah, the, the reasons why yeah. you, you want to go yeah. uh, obviously down that pathway. That would be the, the, the first thing is like why the ramifications. And then obviously, like, are you willing to do what it takes to manage your health? Obviously, taking the health supplements needed, doing your bloods. Obviously, these things that 
are left out of the equation when it comes to making that decision, it's a huge, obviously, in itself, like, you have to be very mindful of your health a lot more than obviously not taking it, but then financially, obviously, like I said, health supplements, bloods, managing your health a lot more, that becomes expensive. even more important. Yeah. And people can kind of put that to the wayside because it's more expensive. Yeah, I don't think people understand the expense that that, that comes hand in hand with being an enhanced athlete, assisted athlete, I should say. It's, you know, I have this rule that if you're not willing to spend the money on keeping yourself right in terms of supplementation, whether it's an echocardiogram, whether it's blood work, when I say get blood work, which will be anywhere from six to eight weeks person dependent, well, then you're not going to be taking PDs as w within my tribe anyway. And I know this is something that we've spoke about, but understanding, you know, the ins and outs of, you know, what can go wrong, so on and so forth is important. And again, the biggest issue with, with, with PDs is, is humans. It's that more is better attitude and, and the difference between, you know, PDs, which is, look, it, a drug is a drug, but with, with PDs, they make you feel better that you operate at a higher level. So that can become very addictive in and of itself. Yeah. So I think that the, the the drawback is going to be always the humans and for the more just wanting more and more. Um, so understanding, you know, all of these aspects is so important, you know, and I'm a big believer in and if you're a coach and you can't comprehensively read bloods and understand bloods, please don't advise PDs. Um, it's hugely important. Um What's the most food you've ever pushed? I struggle with this big time. For me personally, I actually put that picture up last night. It was a thousand, yeah, yeah, thousand yeah. grams of carbs. Um, oh, I, I miss how I looked. I just do not miss how I felt. Yeah. Um, what about you? Have I got you now on the highest, the highest amount? It was. And you pulled it back because my scale weight was back. going was going too high, and I was kind of gaining at a at a, a higher rate. So. The highest I've pushed was just over four thousand. Yeah, and you pulled me back. To, I'm at four one at the minute. So I, I had you on. Did I have you on like seven fifty grams of carbs? Around yeah, there? yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, it's around five thousand, five and a half thousand calories, a thousand grams of carbs. Struggling with this though, you know, it's the the limitation. On and I speak this about. I speak about this time and time, and um, again, is that the limitation is. If, if you're not managing other aspects outside of what we would deem, you know, the obvious. So if you're not measuring, if you're, if you're not managing your sleep, your hydration levels, your stress levels, etc., it's going to impair the brain gut axis. It's going to affect the permeability of gut microbiome. And once we lose the ability to eat, well, then we use the ability to grow. So, and this is something I've used with you time and time again. And it's that, you know, I think that's a really hit home um, way of articulating it that, if we don't mind the gut, outside of just, you know, maybe, you know, gut supplements, which do play a role, obviously, but outside of that, if we don't manage the basics, the gut is going to be impaired, you're going to not be able to eat, you're not going to have the want to eat, the desire to eat, and, you know, you start running into issues, and at that point, then you're pulling back, not to recomp the body, you're pulling back to reset the appetite, mm -hmm. which waste of time, limits things, yeah. Um... You know, so is there anything? Is there anything you see pointless when it comes to training? That's common. There's, I have one pet hate. I, I really have a pet hate, and Go that's on. people putting D handles on a pec deck, because I think it, they're trying to look intelligent. Mm -hmm. I give them benefit of the doubt. Maybe they're just seeing someone else do it. Mm -hmm. But in, from what I can see, the most part is they're trying to look intelligent. But if you've got a line of pull that is is coming closer to your midline. And it's a, it's a well-designed machine and it has a cam and it's going to potentially drop off um, when we want it to drop off uh, as the bicep pulls closer um, to our midline. What the fuck does it, it, it extending the trailing arm do for that? You know, I know we can look at, you know, freedom of the wrist, but being in this position on a fixed, on a, on a fixed handle and being in this position on a fixed um, D handle, there's no need for flexion and extension. Your, your wrist stays here mm -hmm. so it's 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 literally not trying that changing anything so that 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 bothers me um thankfully i've not seen anybody doing it in the hq but i do see it on instagram um and it's very bothersome is there anything that gives you the ick there's 
there's, pr- there's probably a, a lot, but like for some reason, it, the thing jumps out. Like what you mentioned there, attaching things on to make things look better or yeah, obviously look more sexy or whatever to obviously seem. It should only be adding a, adding to adding to an a, a, a an apparatus in the gym to make it inherently more difficult. Mm-hmm. You know, it, when we're looking at mechanically disadvantaging ourselves to the machine and. Know, or making up for where the machine lacks in terms from a joint structure perspective um, and manipulating that profile. But yeah, that is something that gives me the ick. So everybody who trains in the HQ, you're, you're warned. <laughs> if you don't, want. don't do that. Yeah. Um, biggest threat to females on prep, is it healthy? Is it's it a healthy? kind of worms. We could literally make a... <laughs> One word we, answer. We could podcast. literally make a podcast out of this. Maybe we will make a podcast out of this. I think this would be a very topical subject to go through. Yeah, well, if you were to give a one-word answer, I'd say, is it healthy? No, obviously, towards the end of prep. That's yeah. kind of where it's very unhealthy. Obviously, if you look at it as a whole... I think any, I think any sport, any though, sport, at its yeah. extremities, yeah. has its points in time yeah. where it's not healthy. I think, again, we go back to having that understanding of, you know, you as a as a genetically unique individual coming into, you know, a prep, you know, where are you currently at from a psychology perspective and a physiological health perspective? If you've got food issues, body image issues, it's probably not the smartest thing to get up on stage in your in, in a bikini and be judged. Mm-hmm. If you know you've had them previously and you've worked hard to to obviously you know get past that and it's something that's important to you just understanding then you know the aspects of what happens from a hunger regulating hormone perspective when you're in a caloric deficit for so long when you do reach the rounds of you know being legit competition shredded like in in legit shape and so i think many people compete but they miss the mark they don't know what it's truly like to be in legit shape so i think that that is a really really important concept to to understand and for the coach in question to explain to the athlete and then you know aside from that obviously it warrants the question doesn't it from you know well are you going to do this assisted are you going to do this naturally i think that then you know opens up you know if, you, if you're not going to if you're not going to do it naturally and it's assisted well then of course there's going to be ramifications you know or potential ramifications that it need clear understanding you know as to you know well if 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 you're using X, Y, and Z, well then there's a risk of virilization. You know, there's always a risk of infertility. You know, so these things definitely warrant discussion. But at the end of the day, I don't feel that there should be a, a judgmental, you know, standpoint given, you know, especially I think I think the industry is very hypocritical. I know I think I know I'm diverging now into a different segment, but I think the industry in itself is very hypocritical where females will get judged for being a PD user, where ma- where males they won't. Um where you know, I just I think that that that's wrong in and of itself, and we should probably have a podcast around this. As there's a lot to talk about with it, but um, is 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 competing unhealthy? Um, is it healthy for 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 a female? I think there's a lot of healthy attributes. You know, you're going to learn mm. a lot about yourself. You're going to be eating incredibly incredibly well. Your nutrition has to be on point. Your sleep has to be on point. Point. You're training damn hard. Mm. I think you know these are aspects which are only going to benefit you and teach you a lot about yourself and bring your own health and well-being forward. You know, what's the alternative is, you know, people that are saying that it's not it's not healthy, why would you do that? Are the same people that are having two takeaways the weekend and, and going out drinking on a Friday, Saturday, mm. you know? Yeah. So I, I think that within context, um, it is really, really important to, to, to look at things. Yeah. And obviously the route that you go um, is to po- totally dependent up to you. You agree? Um, maybe that we'll finish off with another one that we can, that we could probably, well, we, we, we definitely will, because I know we've touched on it before, um, segment into a different podcast and that would be thoughts. Please people stop, st- don't ask me questions that start with thoughts. I've loads, yeah. loads of thoughts. Thoughts. Um, as in bad thoughts. No, I'm joking. <laughs> so, um, thoughts on stretch mediated hypertrophy and we'll finish with this one. So obviously that's something that's, pretty prevalent now obviously with current research that's come about and again it's that whole like isolation of one thing and not obviously taking everything else into account and just focusing on one thing when there's a bigger picture when it comes to hypertrophy um and what's new what's in 
that's sexy and running with it. And then there's going to be an, another new thing that people will focus on. So obviously, is it important? Yes, of course. Mm. But is think, it the be-all? I think all? the research sort of indicates that anyway, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, clearly. But it's not the be-all and end-all. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where we're, 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 we're getting to here is just people overemphasizing it and just forgetting really about everything else and just focusing on that one lane or that one aspect. I think that the 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 biggest the biggest argument with it is that in in the latest research it's shown that at very least it won't bring you backwards. Mm -hmm. So if you only work a tissue within within its length and range at very least, even if it doesn't bring you forward at a faster rate, it would at very least not bring you backward. Mm -hmm. But I definitely, I definitely agree with you on what you're saying in terms of that. If we were to just, because there's so many coaches that are going to be quite naive and, and quite impressionable that will look at this and, and be like, well, look, I'm only going to train everything in this in the length of the range. Well, actually, a lot of the research is just hamstrings and triceps. Mm -hmm. So to really, you know, mitigate against working mid and short and range and say quads, um, you know, biceps, pec, etc. I think that you're definitely going to leave food on the table, but having an understanding, you know, is 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 one thing. But one thing that Laurent actually uh, always said is always is always stuck with me is that just because you can, should you? Should you? Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's something you took from the IOPN as well. So, yeah, I think that understand the research and um, I think it's definitely valuable. I definitely like. I know it. it Anytime there's a topic, it, it, it can go back and forth mm -hmm. because you can bias to your own research. So I, I, me personally, I will, I'm always after, you know, creating a full range challenge. So working through all the extremities. But I think, I think that I think isn't talked about enough is that it can actually be quite dangerous because what is lengthened? How far is lengthened? Like, and how, how do you progressively overload lengthen? Yeah. And well, you can see, obviously, very recently as well people tearing their pecs and stuff like that and like how far do you go in terms of lengthened mm -hmm. and being able to own that position and take yourself there in a safe manner mm -hmm. because in that lengthened position you are at a higher risk of especially like doing chest press like incline chest press you're vulnerable mm -hmm. to tearing that joint that tearing that muscle at that joint so mm -hmm. that's something that isn't talked about and that can lead someone to injury mm -hmm. so yeah i absolutely agree that is a wrap today, guys. Hope everybody enjoyed the first of the Earn It podcast. And we'll be seeing you soon.